Greetings, everyone. Today we are going to talk about a focus topic, imaging of abdominal and pelvic trauma in pregnancy. I believe this is an important topic because it is often in an area of discomfort for radiologists, meaning whether one is a trainee or a more experienced radiologist, body imager, general radiologist, or emergency radiologist, these cases come up infrequently. And so they can cause discomfort as to how to image patients and what we're looking for. However, these patients do occur. We see them periodically. And it is important to know the current literature in terms of what the radiology and clinical literature states with respect to imaging this particular specific scenario. We'll talk about some potential clinical as well as imaging pitfalls. We'll briefly discuss the current role of these modalities, and it is important to emphasize that unlike the other emergencies that we image for in the abdomen and pelvis, where ultrasound is generally the first test and MRI increasingly is the second test or occasionally even the first test, CT still is the primary test of choice in this scenario. Ultrasound has a role, albeit with limitations. So we'll discuss current algorithms and recommendations for imaging of abdominal and pelvic trauma in pregnancy. I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. I want to thank a few individuals. Dr. Deborah Reed, one of my mentors and chair at Downstate in Brooklyn, New York, introduced me some years ago to the imaging of emergencies in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis in pregnancy, and I thank her for her mentorship. And then since these cases thankfully are uncommon, uh, I want to thank some of my colleagues both in the United States as well as internationally for contributing material to this presentation. This topic takes on a personal aspect when one has a child, as I did four years ago with my wife, and thankfully she had no trauma in pregnancy and had a uncomplicated pregnancy. We have a healthy four-year-old, but it makes it much more of a personal topic. Here he is um, last year at graduation, quote-unquote, graduation from pre-pre-K, and he declared he wanted to be a doctor, which I think is a good thing. And he's a big fan of Thomas, uh, the tank engine, and uh, likes trains and other things. So it becomes less of a theoretical topic when you actually uh, have a child and support a, a partner who has uh, had uh, gone through pregnancy. So let's talk about uh, briefly the area of is there an increased risk of cancer from fetal irradiation related to imaging? And this is a very controversial topic. Uh, I don't pretend to be a medical physicist, but I will give you uh, my take on the current literature. Um, the evidence is not ideal um, and originates from a variety of sources. It is, to my knowledge, an understanding more of a theoretical risk, which could potentially occur from irradiation at any point in pregnancy. And so, for a variety of reasons, we want to ideally eliminate ionizing radiation exposure. As I noted in this particular scenario, it's usually not possible to do that if we have substantial concerns regarding injury uh, to uh, the mother, uh, we're going to generally need a CT scan. Um, but we want to use the appropriate uh, imaging, use radiation wisely, and um, not compromise maternal care. And that can be you know, challenging in this particular scenario. So there have been a variety of papers over the last 10-plus uh, years looking at the average uh, estimated fetal dose from a, quote, routine abdominal and pelvic CT, typically single phase. Um, the first paper here is uh, from the group at Brown, and they estimated about 17 milligray from 435 exams performed over 10 years. And these are all retrospective studies. Uh, two more recent papers, uh, one from the group at Mass General, um, estimated an average fetal dose of about 25 milligrays, so somewhat higher. And then the most recent study I'm aware of uh, from Europe um, estimated about 29 milligray uh, to the fetus. So these numbers seem to be going up um, in the literature. Presumably, 
the dose could be lowered somewhat in the use of CT of the abdomen and pelvis in the trauma setting. But this, again, can be problematic. Why is that? Well, um, later on, the mother obviously gets larger. The cross-sectional diameter increases. We may have to um, use a somewhat higher radiation dose to get diagnostic quality images compared to a, a smaller cross-sectional area. The anatomy becomes crowded. It is more difficult to sort out what's going on. And there are some other potential pitfalls that we'll discuss in terms of the placenta um, that also make uh, analysis difficult later on in gestation. However, um, uh, Cynthia McCullough at uh, Mayo Clinic stated some years ago in the literature, and I'm not aware that anybody has successfully refuted the statement, and I quote, the risk to the conceptus from radiation doses of less than 50 milligray is negligible. So if we're able to use a radiation dose that's you know, substantially less than that and still get diagnostic quality CT, that would be ideal. So there is some actual data published uh, 10 years ago uh, from a group in Ontario, Canada, that showed actually when they looked um, at a group of mothers who had ionizing radiation for medical imaging for a variety of reasons. It was a group of uh, 5,590 mothers compared with a obviously much larger cohort of 1.8 million mothers in Ontario province and Canada who didn't have that exposure, did not need medical imaging that utilized ionizing radiation. When they followed the subsequent children over several years, there was no statistically significant increase incidence in leukemias or other malignancies or other identifiable problems. So here's some actual data refuting the claim, at least over a few years of follow-up that the exposure to ionizing radiation, including CT, um, you know, clearly increases the risk of malignancy, at least not in the first three years of life. Again, it makes just common sense that as in non-pregnant individuals, um, we should be using radiation dose reduction strategies to reduce the dose as much as possible without compromising diagnostic accuracy. And those include a variety of strategies um, that many of you are familiar with, using iterative reconstruction in combination with radiation dose reduction, using auto-MA and other types of techniques. We want to consider documenting the estimated fetal dose if the fetus is in the field of view. And then as far as we're aware, the use of ionated IV contrast does appear to be safe. What about MRI? Well, MRI has been used for well over 20 years for a variety of diagnostic indications for imaging um, during pregnancy, both the mother and the fetus, without any clear documented harmful effects. And this is based on numerous studies uh, over the years now. Um, MRI should be uh, considered um, to be performed if it is clinically indicated, regardless of the gestational age. The American College of Radiology and others recommend written informed maternal consent. And there are some concerns in terms of using higher field strengths, 3T, although it, the latest literature, it appears to be safe to do that. And there are some continuing concerns regarding the effect of noise of the magnet on the fetus and heating effects or SAR from the RF pulses. And so, again, it makes just logical sense to limit the sequences that you do to those that are truly necessary. These are exams that are generally, uh, I believe, should be monitored closely, and others believe that as well, as opposed to just, you know, putting them on autopilot. That same group that I mentioned from Ontario, Canada, demonstrated in another retrospective study of a large series of women in Ontario, Providence, Canada, um, that the women that had an MR during pregnancy compared with a much bigger cohort who did not, no statistically significant adverse effects, again, in terms of uh, fetal anomalies or malignancy or any, any other demonstrable effects over several years of follow-up after the women gave birth. So again, more reassuring data. What about gadolinium? Well, this is uh, generally considered to be contraindicated in pregnancy unless truly warranted. There are concerns regarding potential teratogenicity based on data uh, from rodents, but at much higher concentrations. In general, it's not necessary to give gadolinium to perform MRI of the abdomen and pelvis, and this is a lesser modality in this particular scenario anyway. So, of course, as we alluded to and mentioned earlier, ultrasound 
if we could do ultrasound in this scenario and get an answer, that would be ideal. Um, we generally do do ultrasound in many uh, indications for imaging the acute abdomen, pelvis, and pregnancy, and of course, imaging the fetus for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, if we can get away without doing CT, that would be great. Go on to MRI as necessary as a second line test. But the reality is, again, in the trauma setting, we often need to do CT. So a general concept here is to consider, you know, societal guidelines, what the literature states, um, and then, of course, your own, you know, considering your own personal preferences and the preferences and institutional experience uh, where you practice. The guidelines are emerging, so this lecture in you know, 10 years may be a bit different. The evidence is relatively limited. It's very difficult for obvious reasons to do uh, prospective research on pregnant uh, women. And there may be some scenarios where an institution doesn't have a very specific algorithm or, or, or practice uh, for every scenario. Um, we looked at a... Uh, uh, group of responses from an online survey we conducted a few years ago um, and uh, found out that there was a high consensus in terms of institutional uh, agreement to get conformed consent, having various written policies, modifying CT protocols, avoiding gadolinium, and using ultrasound in most scenarios in this uh, group of respondees from the United States and Canada. Most agreed that CT is the appropriate test in abdominal and pelvic trauma after inconclusive ultrasound. There are some areas where there wasn't the same degree of consensus. So let's talk now specifically about trauma in pregnancy to the abdomen and pelvis. This is the leading non-obstetrical cause of maternal death trauma in general. We'll be focusing on the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, unfortunately, the statistics are upwards of 6 to 7% of all pregnant women have some traumatic event during that pregnancy, ranging from minor incidents to potentially life-threatening traumatic events. These include motor vehicle collisions, falls, and unfortunately, non-accidental trauma. Um, there are multiple reports of non-accidental trauma in pregnancy as being a substantial problem. Making assessment difficult, there are physiologic changes during pregnancy that can mask the seriousness of injury to both the mother and the fetus. And the risk to the fetus is quite variable depending on the type of injury. There isn't necessarily a great correlation. Things that appear to be otherwise minor trauma can actually be life-threatening to the fetus. But certainly if the mother has major injuries and is in shock, the fetal death rate is very high, approaching 80%. A variety of things can happen, especially later in gestation, including placental abruption, um, which can uh, threaten the fetus. There are a variety of papers looking at the management of pregnant trauma patients. They tend to be over-admitted, yet under-evaluated. A recent paper showed that one one did a age... Um, matched control of trauma patients of women who were pregnant versus those who were not, that those who were pregnant had a statistically significantly worse outcome. As I mentioned, most of the serious injuries um, from trauma tend to occur in the third trimester for a variety of reasons. These uh, injuries can lead to serious consequences, including spontaneous abortion, preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, placental abruption, placental laceration, infarction, and uterine laceration and rupture un uncommonly. Um, penetrating trauma, um, the uh, risk to the fetus goes up, as, which makes sense, later in gestation, a bigger target, but there is also some associated increase in maternal organ present protection of the fetus, again, to the expense of the mother, later in gestation. So we need accurate and rapid imaging. Again, the mother absolutely comes first in this scenario. We should not delay uh, or deter imaging because of radiation exposure concerns. And again, we're usually going to have to do CT. Um, but again, we need to follow the Alara principle. Um, analysis can be challenging, uh, particularly if the pregnant patient has decreased mental status, 
it can be very difficult to assess, you know, their clinical um, situation and imaging may become particularly important in that scenario. So I'm not going to discuss radiography, at least not of the abdomen and pelvis. This currently has a very minor supplemental role. Um, it's, it's not the primary test of choice and generally not on most of any algorithms in this particular scenario. So we'll talk about ultrasound. Ultrasound certainly, um, as with non-pregnant patients, has a role, the FAST exam, for rapidly screening in the emergency setting, the abdomen and pelvis for free intraperitoneal fluid. Uh, for the more obvious solid organ injuries, and we can also look quickly for pleural and pericardial effusions, which are usually hemorrhage in this scenario. We can, of course, also perform a phenyl sonogram. So the most experience for the FAST exam in the setting of pregnancy comes from the University of California, San Diego, and I've included two uh, references from that group. The third bullet, a paper from 15 years ago now, showed the detection rate using the FAST exam in pregnant trauma patients to be in the range of 61 to 86 percent sensitivity, so a more limited sensitivity, but a high specificity of approaching 100 percent. A more recent paper from that group, they looked at 372 pregnant patients who underwent the FAST exam. Notice only a small number were uh, positive. There were seven true positives and one false positive. But as far as they could determine, the vast majority of the other patients, 365, were true negatives. And they have a very rigorous system of trauma assessment and follow-up at that institution. Here's an example of a 28-year-old woman who was uh, 12 weeks pregnant. She fell down the stairs, and the uh, screening ultrasound shows a, a perirenal hematoma. This was managed conservatively and just showing you a representative image from the pelvis showing the pregnancy. Here's a case from my institution from a few years ago, a 29-year-old, 16 weeks pregnant, involved in a motor vehicle collision. You can see the fetal heart rate and the pelvis, placenta, uterus, fetus, everything looked okay. Ultrasound, as with many scenarios, unfortunately, in imaging the acute abdomen and pelvis has major limitations. And one of the major limitations in this situation is with respect to assessing the placenta for abruption. Ultrasound in general is not a great test for placental abruption at this stage, with or without trauma, but it certainly has substantial limitations that have been shown in a variety of papers in this scenario. This one paper I've highlighted here from a few years ago from the group at UC. Uh, Davis. It was a retrospective review, relatively small number of patients, 27, but the two radiologists reviewed these patients who had both CT and ultrasound in the trauma setting of the abdomen and pelvis were blinded to the outcomes and to the specific information. They knew the patients had undergone trauma. However, there were a total of three complete abruptions and eight partial abruptions. The ultrasound results retrospectively were markedly limited. CT had, uh, again, very high sensitivity in this scenario, but only about a 56% specificity. And the reason for that with respect to assessing the placenta were that, especially later in gestation, there are a variety of things that can be variants or can be just the normal findings that one sees in a more advanced pregnancy, such as age-related infarcts other processes, cotyledons, marginal sinuses, these all increase the heterogeneity of the uterus on CT, and so it can be more difficult, even if one knows one is looking for an abruption, to identify that particular situation. Another thing to be aware of is that um, one thinks about seeing free fluid in the pelvis in the non-pregnant woman as being a relatively common finding, but in fact, the literature shows in the, in the pregnant uh, patient that fluid in the pelvis is generally uncommon. And so if you do see free fluid in the pelvis, unless the patient has undergone substantial fluid resuscitation at that point with some third spacing, it is an indicator that there may be something wrong. Certainly, ultrasound has its limitations, uh, especially later on in gestation, as with any of the other scenarios we might consider for imaging the acute abdomen and pelvis in pregnancy. 
And that's, of course, because of the habitus, the larger cross-sectional diameter, things are in the way, the uterus is bigger, ballast being pushed, the anatomy is distorted, there's more vascularity, so it is more challenging to assess. So what should we do if the sonogram is negative, and usually it's going to be negative? Do we do a follow-up sonogram in a, in a day or, or less? Do we do an immediate CT in everybody, and some people? Do we even consider MRI? If CT is felt to be necessary, and that's a, generally a clinical call, um, if the ultrasound is done and is negative, should you know we use relatively low radiation dose? Well, I think we should. But again, we have to consider the stage of the gestation. Should we even considering, you know, excluding the pelvis, especially if we have a low index of suspicion and we're just trying to clear the patient? That latter point is, is, is debatable. There's a very nice uh, paper, thought-provoking, from the group at UC Davis from four years ago um, for Dr. Corman and all. And they retrospectively did that and saw what would they have missed. And they would have missed a few things, but it wouldn't have put the mother or fetus at, at major risk as far as at least in their relatively small retrospective study. So certainly, as with a non-pregnant patient, CT is much more sensitive than ultrasound for detecting um, the subtler injuries to the abdomen and pelvis, certainly to the bowel, uh, to the retroperitoneum. CT also very well demonstrates um, the placenta of the uterus and may rarely even demonstrate fetal injuries. Again, there are potential pitfalls, which we'll discuss. If there are maternal pelvic fractures, um, generally late in the third trimester, we have to be concerned about seeing fetal skull uh, fractures and, and actually seeing intracranial injuries, which can be identified on CT. The problem as alluded to with respect to the placenta is that one may not be familiar with the normal appearance of the placenta, especially later on in gestation. There are pitfalls. The appearance is variable. And one may not necessarily be carefully looking at the placenta in this scenario, so we really need to do that. Um, and to uh, think about if we're looking at a normal finding or if we're seeing an injury. In general, we want to reduce um, multiple, act, multiple passes through the same area if we, unless we really have to. Um, we want to reduce overlap, and especially if the fetus is in the field of view. This is a scenario where, again, we want to be fairly hands-on. We want to be real-time assessing this. And this is one scenario where, again, we want to not use ultra-low radiation dose protocols. Um, this is not a scenario for reducing the dose to such a point that we get a non-diagnostic CT. This is not a uh, renal colic assessment, for example, where we can really go you know, quite low with the radiation dose and still get diagnostic quality images, especially if the main concern is ureteral stone, yes or no, and where is it? Uh, a group at Maricopa County in... Um, uh, Arizona uh, seems to have the largest experience for some reason with um, looking at the placenta on CT in, in, in trauma. And um, they had a very high rate of placental abruption in a review of 176 pregnant patients. The 35% yield of 61 out of that 176 were positive. And when they looked to see, not surprisingly, the association of the extent of placental abruption with the need for emergency delivery, the greater the extent of the vascularization of placenta on CT, particularly if it was three quarters or more, uh, independently correlated with the need for emergency delivery. They didn't use the CT to make those determinations. Generally, this was based on retrospective analysis. But important information in terms of you see substantial placental uh, devitalization, that should push uh, for emergency um, uh, surgery. Other considerations in imaging of pregnant patients um, with trauma to the abdomen and pelvis include displacement of organs. So the bladder um, tends to be elevated and is more susceptible to injury. The kidneys are enlarged and may be more susceptible to injury. The uterus can displace the liver and spleen against ribs, making those organs more susceptible to injury. And just because of the increased vascularity of the pelvis, retroperitoneal hemorrhage is more common. Here's a case from my institution. This was uh, a normal placenta um, in the third trimester, and you can see there is some heterogeneity. It's an anterior placenta, uh, but this was normal. There was no associated hemorrhage or fluid collection, and this uh, patient did fine, as did the fetus. Two cases I've borrowed from my colleagues. Um, 
with respect to a lower uh, grade type injuries to the liver on our left and the spleen on our right. Um, after motor vehicle collisions, these were pregnant patients, separate pregnant patients, and they did uh, fine with conservative management. Everything else was okay on the scans. Here was a case from my institution of a uh, 24-week pregnant uh, woman who uh, had significant injury. You can see the complex liver laceration. You can see uh, the hemoperitoneum. And then on the upper right, you can see a cleft in the placenta. This placenta is abrupted, it is disrupted, and there's active hemorrhage as demonstrated by that small arrow. There's bulging posteriorly from adjacent hemorrhage, and this uh, fetus unfortunately did not survive. Um, the CT was done um, because of staging of the uh, organs of the mother. Uh, the obstetrical team knew in this instance that the fetus um, you know, was at risk. They did this very quickly. They knew there was an abruption, um, but unfortunately the, the baby uh, didn't, didn't survive. Here's a case from uh, my colleagues at, uh, at the time, uh, Cookie Menius and Vinnie Malik, still at, at Washington St. Louis Malincrot. Um, and this is a case where if you're not familiar with what the placenta should look like, you might not appreciate the fact that the entire placenta is abnormal. It's, it's uniformly devascularized. There's associated hemorrhage extending into the vagina, and the lower amniotic cavity in this fetus uh, did not survive. Here's a case from uh, Dr. Soto at Boston University Medical Center of intimate partner violence. This person's uh, woman's significant other um, stabbed her. You can see the retroperitoneal hemorrhage on the left. Um, this was a triple contrast exam in this particular scenario because of the penetrating trauma. There was no violation of the colon and this patient did uh, fine with conservative management. To my knowledge, there's no large-scale study looking at the use of CT um, or in a subset of women or all women after blunt trauma with or without initial sonography. There's very limited literature on the use of MR, um, and understandably so because of the you know, problems of getting a woman into an MR scanner in this particular scenario, again, different than appendicitis or renal colic in terms of the need for monitoring and resuscitation. MR, however, has been proposed for problem-solving and stable pregnant patients after trauma for follow-up, if there's new symptomatology, to assess soft tissue injuries, to assess possible spinal injuries, to look at uh, placental um, injuries uh, in more detail. Um, and again, we're using non-contrast breath hold sequences as the mainstay, just as with any other kind of MR of the abdomen and pelvis in this scenario without contrast. Here is a case from my institution a few years ago. The patient uh, was involved in motor vehicle collision, 24 weeks pregnant. She refused CT because of the ionizing radiation. She was stable. She had back and pelvic pain. And these are just some representative coronal images. This exam was negative, so we're able to uh, reassure the patient and the clinical team. A little bit of right hydronephrosis kind of expected at this stage of pregnancy. In contrast, here's an example of a positive scan. There's some uh, perihepatic uh, fluid. There's a right pleural effusion. There's some soft inju injury, and these are uh, very uh, well demonstrated um, on these images without contrast. We can't assess for active hemorrhage, but we can see many, many things given the level of both uh, spatial resolution and contrast resolution here. Certainly when the mother is stabilized, an uh, obstetrical ultrasound can be done as in the non-trauma setting to assess the fetus placenta, provide uh, monitoring to the fetus uh, in other ways, um, as is done again in the non-trauma patient with fetal monitoring, and then the mother in the third trimester ideally should be put in the left lateral decubitus position if possible. So in conclusion, we've gone over a review of the current status of imaging of the abdomen and pelvis and trauma. If we can get the information we need with ultrasound, um, you know, that would be great. Unfortunately, there are substantial limitations. It's still the first line test with a fast exam, uh, but we may in many of uh, these patients need to go on to a more definitive test, particularly CT. We want to reduce the dose, but not make it so low that we don't have a diagnostic quality exam. And then in general, we want to use the Allara principle. We occasionally will image a patient who we don't know is pregnant. And this is a particular example you're going to see. This was a 30-year-old underwent a non-contrast CT, and she wasn't even known to be pregnant. She had uh, hemorrhage here in the pelvis. Um, and you can see the round 
uh, gestational uh, sac here, or at least the endometrium being round, implying the presence of a gestation as opposed to uh, uh, someone who would not be pregnant, as well as the pelvic fractures. So if we uh, occasionally will encounter this in both the trauma and other scenarios um, where either we don't do a, a pregnancy test, forget to do it, or um, there's just in the trauma setting no time to do it, uh, if we use uh, the Alara principle, we will reduce the radiation dose if we, in fact, irradiate a woman who we didn't know was pregnant and discover, uh, and sometimes based on the CT itself or other imaging itself, the patient is pregnant, uh, we can then reduce uh, exposure to the fetus. A continuing collaborative effort is needed amongst the clinical team caring for these patients, obstetrics, obstetricians, gynecologists, surgeons, and radiologists. We want to integrate the fetal trauma survey with ATLS. We need to continue to educate our clinicians as to the role of imaging. There's still a lot of misinformation and misperceptions about the, the risks and benefits of these tests. I particularly like this quote, and I'll close with this. This is from uh, some years ago in the urological literature, and I quote, inaccurate missed or delayed diagnosis may represent a more significant risk to the patient, i.e. the fetus and the mother, than the radiation risk. And so with that, I'll leave you with some images of my son, and I hope this is helpful to you in your current as well as future practices. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for the honor of being asked to present uh, this lecture.